we have to switch some priorities because as leaders, we have to do more to keep our people together now than we ever did before. So maybe you need to add another meeting this week. Maybe you need to extend that meeting half an hour. But if keeping our people together and connected is important, it's, it's just, it, it, where does it fit on the priority list? Yes, I sat there and we have an hour long staff meeting twice a month nationally. And I'll tell you, it's, it's full. These are C-level executives. They're not gonna log in for an hour long meeting if it's a bunch of you know, fluff. And yet we took 20 minutes to go through those pictures. This time, we don't normally, it goes through at like five. This time was really important. One, we were celebrating something, but if, if the people in the organization do drive the organization, we have to make time for those people. And right now, they're feeling disconnected. They're sitting alone in an apartment. They're stuck, you know, with a, trying to educate a, you know, an eight-year-old who can't sit in a chair still, even if they're sitting in a classroom and they're dealing with that now. So they need the social release and the fun. And if we provide that, that, that builds that, yes, I have friends at the office. Yes, this company cares about me. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammond. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Now that everything has changed about your way of working together, that you have to think about what you're going to do to shape the culture in a remote world. Yes, today we're still struggling with COVID, unfortunately, and the numbers are not getting better. And so what's going to happen with your workforce? Do you want to continue to kind of patch it together or do you want to accept this new reality and, and lead with intention and purpose around creating a culture in a remote world that works in today's kind of uncertainty? Well, today our special guest is Art Saxby. He's the founder CEO of Chief Outsiders. They are a CMO kind of for higher business. They, they really do uh, help companies grow in a different way than me. So I partnered with them to, to bring you this episode to really create something that would be useful for you as a leader of a remote culture. Today's remote workers feel disconnected. They feel uh, you know, like they would love to have more um, people available to them or more conversations in a different way collaboration is a little bit harder and in micro conversations almost non-existent unless you're really intentional about it. So what we're going to talk about today is some of the things that get in the way of a remote culture that really does work and some of the things you can do to actually improve that as a leader. And I will let you in on a clue. Your job as a leader is to own this, this culture and shape it the way you want and make sure that it is working for the company because if it doesn't work, then the people will either not show up and and not really give their heart and soul into the work, or they will go somewhere else and give their work to, to someone else. So you take your pick. You either do it up front or pay the price. Before we jump into the interview with Art, let me go through one little thing that I want to make sure that you're tuned into. If you want to create a team of A players, I've got a free training that goes through the, the big mistakes that you're making. Just go to genehammett.com forward slash training. You can get those mistakes. You can figure out how to fix them and take your leadership to the next level. Just go to genehammett.com forward slash training. Now here's the interview with Art Saxby. Art, how are you? Very good. How are you doing this morning, Gene? I'm excited to have you here. I'm doing great. I uh, still got my, my beard from the, the summer vacation. When you think about uh, coming on the show, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about what Chief Outsiders does. We've had Karen on the show before, but I know you're, you being the CEO founder, you probably have a little bit way, different way to describe it. You know, I'd say our, our, our role is to work with mid-sized companies. And we've often found that sometimes the best run companies have the hardest time growing because growing a company is very different skill sets than running a company. And in, in today's market, it's, it's really a question of how do you, how do you design and build a commercial engine get that engine running and going. Most, of, most mid-sized companies can't afford to hire an executive level vice president of marketing. They don't need that skill set forever. So we go in as a part-time member of the CEO's management team. We have 75 chief marketing officers full-time on staff, and they often work with the company one to two days a week over six to 12 months to create and implement significant growth, growth 
you know, initiatives. Well, I know it's a big part of what companies are struggling with now, what used to work in the area of live in-person conferences and all the marketing that went with that. We're having to rethink it. I've had clients who are rethinking it. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. We're going to be looking at um, some different aspects behind the remote culture. I'd love for you to, I know you're working with a lot of companies. You've actually ran a, a remote company with 80 plus employees for you know, over uh, 10 years. When you think about re a remote culture, what are the first things that come to mind as where people get it wrong? You know, I, I, I believe that it's, it's basis culture needs to be, you know, in, embedded is part of the strategy. Um, Peter Drucker was the first one who's at least credited with saying culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, I'd ask, what, do they, what have they always told us was the most important meal of the day? Breakfast. Yep. So the, the company strategy needs to actually be feeding the culture. When, when I started this, this company, I looked and said, you know, what do I re what's the business strategy? What do I really want to be great at? What does the company need to be you know, known for? Um, and, and it had to do with the, the people in the company loving what they're doing and, and being able to do what they love to do, supporting each other. So from the beginning, we said our business strategy was to create a company and a culture that attracted the world's greatest marketers because we help each other do the best work of our career, surrounded by people we love to learn from. So our only long-term competitive advantage was culture. But I was also looking at a situation where, well, everyone is always going to be remote from the beginning. My, and now we're up to 75 people, but they're all working out of home offices all across the country. So said we had to figure out a way to keep a tight organization, not because it was fun or cool, but because it really was our business strategy. So what are some of the things that, that are, people are getting wrong in today's remote culture aspects? I, I think we need to, to think about it in two ways, because right, we've had a sudden change and a lot of people are, are forced to go you know, remote. I think there's the, the professional side and the personal side. The professional side is, is how can people, how can we as leaders help our people do what they love to do? How can we help them be successful? There's the business side, whether that's, that's tools, techniques, whether that's um, you know, meetings and, um, uh, you know, and, and the, the pace of staying connected, the tools to get things done. And a lot of people are focused on that. And, and we can always talk about, about that. But the other side is the personal side. For an awful lot of people in our organizations, going to the office was part of their social circle. They had friends at the office. We used to say if you didn't, you know, customer, um, employee surveys, one of the key questions was to ask, do you have a friend at the office? If a person said, yes, I have a good friend at the office, there's a high probability they stay with your company. Where if they say, no, I don't have friends at the office, there's a high probability they won't be there next year. You know, does my boss have my back? High probability they'll stay versus they won't. Those are, are, are more you know, um, emotional things about friends and camaraderie and, and socialization. And when you all suddenly rip everyone apart and say, you know, you're working from home and you know, I'm, I've got two grown daughters and they're both sitting in apartments alone working from home for four months, um, you know, they start to lose the connection. So I think while we're, we're doing a lot of things to keep people connected from the business side, we need to be sure we take time to keep them connected on the social side on the, the little more fun stuff, not just because we want fun things or we want to be the fun boss, but to, to keep our employees and keep them connected, they have to feel emotionally connected, not just professionally connected. Hold on for a second. He said something really interesting. He said, in a survey to customers, you want to make sure that they believe, the employees, that their boss has their back. So let me ask you a question. What would your employees say if you asked them that question? Would they, do you know 100% that they would say that with all of the direct reports you have? Maybe you do have 100% there, but do you know with 100% that all the people that are in mid-level management, their frontline employees would respond back as their boss has their back? Because if they don't feel like they have their back, then they don't feel psychologically safe. And it really is an issue as the company continues to grow. This whole question about does the boss have your back is something that will allow you to clue into what's going on in a sense of safety. And that really does impact growth. It impacts the culture and shapes whether people stay or leave. Now back to art. 
Now, one of the things that I feel like a lot of leaders are missing touch with is we're not able to just kind of stroll the halls and, you know, walk around and have conversations, say hi, maybe even share, you know, a moment at the, the coffee machine or the, the drink machine or, you know, just really check in, maybe even some micro conversations. A lot of that stuff has, is gone. How right. do we how do we replace that, or how do we think about that in this new remote culture world? You need to to purposely make time for it. One of the things that that we've done for years, again, since our my people are remote, but I really need them to like each other, to know each other, to work together. We start every every staff meeting with photographs of what I did on my summer vacation, and we have our staff meetings nationally twice a, a month, but. People send in pictures of here's where I went on the vacation, me and the kids, and here's so and so's graduation, and and you know, and at the baseball game, or you know. So for for years, we started every meeting with, let's talk, let's get to know each other's family, and be able to share in the fact that someone's kid just graduated college, someone actually got to go on a vacation. We we're continuing that now, obviously, um, where it may be you're locked in, but then we're we're coming up with other reasons for people to send in pictures and share. Um, early on in, in the crisis, we said, um, I sent out a thing. I took a picture of myself in my, my business attire, as I am now, in my little exercise shorts that I'm wearing now, bare feet, standing in the front yard with a sign that said, um, evacuation zone one, and said, you know, we want to keep focus on safety. So we're calling a fire drill. No matter what you're doing, no matter what you wear, leave the building, go and take a picture of yourself outside the building. So I know you made it to the fire drill, you know, station. And it, we had, you know, about 80% of people responded and they sent in pictures or they just, they walked out and they're there with a, a cup of coffee standing in the backyard and, and, you know, some were dressed, some were more dressed. And it was just, it was just fun to share pictures of each other. This last week we celebrated our 1000th client. So we said, we're having an ice cream social in the break room. Everyone come on down to the break room. We're having ice cream. Oh, well, the break room's actually my kitchen and you live in, live in a different state. So I'm sending you $1,000. No, hold it. 1,000 pennies. Everyone got 10 bucks and said, go buy an ice cream, get a picture of you eating your ice cream and send it in and we'll share it, share it at the next staff meeting. And this staff meeting we had literally, you know, 40 pictures of people with their kids eating ice cream, some great big giant things with, you know, sprinkles on some very nice, you know, very nice prim proper, you know, frozen yogurt and other stuff. But it was, it, it, it was an opportunity to share me and my family and what I was doing. One guy sitting there with a cigar and, and a, you know, an ice cream cone and someone else is at the gym. So make opportunities so your people can share who they are with each other. Art, one of the things I hear back from people, because I, I really do talk about this being intentional, but they will respond back to me when I say that we should be getting personal in our meetings is, you know what, we have a limited amount of time for, for meetings. We have, um, we have to get really down to business right away. We, we don't really have time for, for this personal element inside this. Uh, I know that that's short-sighted, but what is your response to someone who's, who says, we just don't have time for that personal stuff? It's all where your priorities lie. It's what my high school band director told me when I couldn't get my uniform clean and I showed up missing a, you know, part of the uniform. He said, Art, it's all where your priorities lie. If you're, we have to switch some priorities because as leaders, we have to do more to keep our people together now than we ever did before. So maybe you need to add another meeting this week. Maybe you need to extend that meeting half an hour. But if keeping our people together and connected is important, it's, it's just, it, it, where does it fit on the priority list? Yes, I sat there and we have an hour long staff meeting twice a month nationally. And I'll tell you, it's, it's full. These are C-level executives. They're not going to log in for an hour long meeting if it's a bunch of, you know, fluff. And yet we took 20 minutes to go through those pictures. This time, we don't normally, it goes through in like five. This time was really important. One, we were celebrating something, but if, if the people in the organization do drive the organization, we have to make time for those people. And right now, they're feeling disconnected. They're sitting alone in an apartment. They're stuck, you know, with a, trying to educate a, you know, an eight-year-old who can't sit in a chair still, even if they're sitting in a classroom and they're dealing with that now. So they need the social release and the fun 
And if we provide that, that, that builds that, yes, I have friends at the office. Yes, this company cares about me. Now, are you seeing any impact from leaders personally scheduling more one-on-one -on -one meetings through, through Zoom or something like that inside this world? And, and if so, where do you kind of see that fitting into the overall culture uh, kind of shaping process? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I normally try and do, you know, one, again, with 80 people in the company all across the country, I'll only see them face to face twice a year. Even my number two is, is in Austin. I'm in Houston. He's three hours away. Now we see each other on Zoom almost every day, but the, the other folks, since they're all working accounts and this and that, I'll only physically see them twice a year. So I normally try and schedule one to two one-on-ones a week. And because of schedules, I end up with three or four a month. Well, I've, I've doubled up that list of, I've got to be doing more and more and more and more. Um, they're busy, so that, again, they don't always, uh, they fall off the calendars, you know, the client stuff comes first, this and that, but um, more and more and more, we need to, to put, make it a priority and reach out. And when I have a one-on-one -on -one with someone, um, you know, it's, it's not a business review. You know, it's, it's, tell me what's happening in your life. You know, how's the culture going? Um, are you feeling connected? Are you feeling, you know, are you getting support from your peers? Um, the one-on-ones for me have, have always been, you know, what are we doing right in the culture? What need, what do we need to continue to build? How do we make sure we've got as tight a culture when we're at 300 people as we did when we were at 30, which is, you know, versus 10. Um, so the, the one-on-ones shouldn't necessarily be straight business. Yes, it, I always do take time and I look up their, their stats before the call. So I know if, you know, this is a rock star, this is someone who's struggling, this is whatever. Um, but I do really believe we have to make time to connect so that they feel we care about them and feel connected. Now, hold on for a second. Artis said, this conversation one-on-one -on -one is not a business review. Well, a business review is where you talk about the work, you talk about the, the output, the milestones, the client, the relationship. What this is, is a chance for you to connect with the person at an individual level. What's going on in your life? What's going on in your world? What do you want more of? How is the culture supporting you or not supporting you? Where could we improve? Now you ask those kind of questions and allows you to tune into people. If you want the exact questions that you can actually ask in these conversations, we call this the stay conversation. All you have to do is go to a special free gift I'm gonna give you. It's called genehammett.com forward slash stay. S-T-A-Y, and you can get those questions and it will give you kind of an insight around how to have these stay conversations that are really important to help you shape the culture and build a culture of people that are really working together in full alignment. So just go to the genehammett.com forward slash stay. Okay, back to the interview with Art. You know, I think a lot of people think that one-on-one -on -one time is just a chance to, to tune in to what work is going on, what the client situation is, and they rarely take chance to really tune into the person at an individual level. Um, and what this reminds me of is a lot of times I have to talk to my clients about this and said, you know, at some point in time, it's not just about managing the work, but it's about leading the people. Exactly. When you think about that, what does that mean when it, when it comes to a remote culture in today's world? The remote cultures can work very, very well if, the, the people in the organization are allowed to do what they love to do. Now, quite often, um, when someone's doing what they love to do, that may, that's often the thing that's the highest value for the employer. You know, when I get my people on the right assignment and they're doing what they love to do, I mean, it's release the hounds. They are, they are delivering value like crazy. This is their thing. So you need to understand that, um, Learning what they really care about will help them perform better. Um, but it's if you can't stick your head in the office, if you can't pull together in the co conference room for five minutes, um, it's not their job to stay connected to the company. It is the leadership team's job. So yeah, some of my one-on-ones with my management team, with my direct reports, you know, those are business reviews. Okay, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? But then there's a different meeting that's, you know, okay, tell me what's happening with the family. How you dealing with the COVID thing? You know, are your kids going back to school? I do that with the, the rest of the organization that, that, you know, aren't my direct reports. 
you've said this a couple of times. I want to make sure we put a spotlight on this, but you, you talked about, you know, a great culture really is when people are doing what they love to do. How do you as a CEO, uh, you know, tune into that and, and really do it? I mean, is it pretty, is it just asking them what do they love to do? Or is there some other way you have, you've found to, to reach them? It's, it's um, for us, it's part of the, the company and the challenge. Imagine everyone who works for us as being a vice president of marketing at one or more op large operating companies. So every one of them whose last job was vice president of marketing at t or WebMD or ADP or, you know, 75 of them, all of them, their resume could say the exact same thing. You know, grew share and brand and that, 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 that. Said, but I start out when they join the organization saying, you know, we've never had anyone in the company like you. You might be the 10th SaaS software person we have on the team, but no one like you. Now, our job, your job is to figure out what is different than you versus those others? Because why should we put you in front of this client instead of them? So it's, it's a two-part challenge. It's a challenge for them to figure out what, are, what makes them unique and special and us to recognize that they are unique and special. If you happen to be listening to this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. Give us a thumbs up. It really helps us with that uh, YouTube algorithm. We really love to get more of this content in front of the right people, and it costs you absolutely nothing to give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell notification button if you want to be notified the next time we drop a video. Now, back to the interview. Well, I want to wrap this up, Art, with I always love some, some counterintuitive wisdom, uh, something that's a little bit unorthodox. What comes to mind when you think about you know, really creating an effective remote culture that is unconventional? Firing people. All right. Um, yeah, I hate firing people. I am a, I am a conflict avoider. That is not, not what I do. Um, early on in the company, there was probably six of us. And, and you know, we're a small management consulting company just getting going, almost zero revenue. And we got this guy through a connection of a connection who had been the chief marketing officer of one of the 10 biggest consumer companies in the world. He had been... The, the chairman or the, the head of the Africa group for this company. And he had basically stepped back, retired, and he was working for us. And this guy was like really, really smart, really, really strong. And boy, does this resume mean something when you got this little tiny consulting company. But I realized that every time we're in staff meeting, we're discussing things, you know, the things he was saying was absolutely right. And yet it always felt like an argument. And I was saying, you know, why is it that I'm agreeing with you and it's feeling like an argument. Why is it as soon as he stops, starts speaking, the air gets sucked out of the room and everyone quiets down? Why am, you know, and, and I ended up, you know, it was difficult, but I ended up having to fire him. And when I went to the organization and said that, I was afraid they were all gonna go, you're an idiot, we're, we're leaving. This guy was our, you know, our ticket to fame. And they all said, oh, thank gosh, finally. My gosh, you know, if, if we had a bunch of people like that, I wouldn't stick around. He was so smart, he had to be the smartest person in the room. Where now we look for people who are so smart and have such incredible experience, they don't have to be the smartest people in the room. So the few times I've had to fire someone who was a really good business performer, who had a really great resume, who's really smart, really, but they were wrong for the culture. I, I, it was hard, it was hard, it was hard. And every time I did it, the organization came back and went, well, finally, gosh, we knew that guy wasn't a fit the first time. It's like. Well, tell me. <laughs> so believe it or not, I mean, we, we, we hear it a lot, but, you know, hire slow, fire fast. But firing someone because they don't fit the culture strengthens the culture, especially in the leadership team. The organization will look and see, I don't care what the CEO says, who do they have in their inner circle? Who do they keep? That's what they really care about. And if they really care about someone who delivers great dollars and is a complete jerk to work with, that's who they want around. Where if they say, you know what, we're building a company of people that we, a company we want to belong to, and they're willing to move someone out because they're disrupting it. The organ says, organization says, that's what they believe. Well, Art, I really appreciate you saying that because I think a lot of leaders have that uh, resistance to letting go of people. They, they wonder, especially high performers, because they wonder the impact it's going to have but it is an important decision to make that there, there really is no level of performance that, that over, you know, supersedes keeping that person there if they're toxic. 
So yep. I really appreciate you being on the podcast, sharing your wisdom on leadership and culture. Thank you. I've enjoyed it, Gene. What a great interview. I love talking about leadership and culture with someone who's done it before, but also sees so many varieties within other companies. He works with a lot of companies that I work with and Art really has a lot of insight around what does it take to lead with intention, that remote culture in today's uncertainty. So when you think about all the things that are necessary for you as a leader, there's probably a lot of things on your mind. You're maybe not sure exactly what to do next. I'd love to help you figure out what that is. One of the things I'm really great at is helping you figure out what is the biggest thing that you can do as a leader to grow the company. And it probably has something to do with your own leadership and culture. What's missing? What is that missing element? I can help you do that. All you have to do is reach out to me, gene at genehammett.com. When you think about leadership, when you think about growth, make sure you think of growth think tank. As always, lead with courage. I'll see you next time.